like to invite you to sing along with us this morning. Let's stand and sing, It's Amazing What Praising Can Do. Let's so all sing it out. <laughs> name. Number 202. be the name, number 206. Blessed be the name, 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 bl
first song we begin that little course how it sounds more and more assuring it's amazing what praising can do let's sing it again everyone big and loud You may be seated. The ushers come forward. Nathan, you want to pray for us? Lord, thank you for this day. I pray that you would bless this offering. Um, I pray that um, we would worship you with all our hearts. Um, I pray that you would give Papa words to say. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
crashes down on you. God will listen to you when the sky turns black. with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to finish chapter 2 this morning. I want to remind you kind of the progression of what things have been, we've been talking about. The book of Ephesians as a whole has really three major themes running through it. The first one is that we are already seated in the heavenlies with Christ. Now, of course, that doesn't mean physically because we're not there yet. But it does mean that what Jesus has done for us is, is, is a solid thing. It's not something we hope will happen. Our sins have already been forgiven. And that because we have died with Christ, we were raised with Christ. And so because Christ is physically in the heavens at the right hand of the Father, and we are spiritually in Him, that makes us seated in the heavenlies with Him. Then the movement of thought is that because we have been established there, because of that, we should be walking with Christ. So we're going to be moving um, in another chapter or so into chapters 4, uh, 4 and 5, where we begin talking about um, walk, what does it mean to walk with Christ? What does it mean to walk in the Lord? And finally, the book ends with the understanding that um, because of the war that's going on around us, that there is a way for us to stand against the schemes of the enemy, uh, stand when tri trials and troubles come, how can we stand? That's the way the book is, is, is laid out. That's what Paul is teaching us in the book of Ephesians. And it's kind of interesting. I, I have a feeling that I probably would have started backwards in other words, this is the type of book that would be a good suggestion for someone who's saying, I just feel so overcome by the world, I want to know how to stand. Well, let me help you understand how to stand. But before you can stand, you've got to learn how to walk. You've got to learn how to walk with Christ. But before you can walk with Christ, you have to recognize it's not in your own strength, it's not in your own power. It's because He has already seated you in the heavenlies with Him if you're a believer. 
This morning's sermon really is directed toward believers because that's what this passage of Scripture, that's who Paul is talking to, the Ephesian Christians. And so I want to start off with saying that if you're not a believer, this isn't going to make a lot of sense, nor does it apply to you. And so the invitation is right here from the beginning. You can be one of the saints. You can be one who has been seated in the heavenlies. And it doesn't because, come because of the goodness of your behavior or because of anything other than trusting in faith. Ephesians chapter 2, we read it just a few weeks ago. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This not of yourselves, not an act of work so that no one should boast. We're not saved because of our own strength or our own goodness or our own anything. We're saved because of faith in Christ by grace. With all of that said, as it, um, we're ready to look at these verses this morning. I'm going to start reading Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to start reading in verse 18. For through him, that's Jesus, we both, that's Jews and Gentiles, have ex access to one spirit. In one spirit to the Father. Stop there. Where we ended last week was we talked about um, Paul's message. Look in verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, that you were lost. You had all these problems. But Christ, what he did is he made two. He made one out of the two. So that Gentiles who have faith in Christ are just as much as believers as Jews who have faith in Christ. And again, we're all Gentiles. We live in a Gentile world. We are, we are fully aware of that. But this was brand new. There were a lot of Jews who didn't think it was possible for Gentiles. How could they? How, do, how could they know God? And Paul says, well, that whole circumcision thing, even when a Abraham underwent that, it wasn't the action it was that the action came because of the faith. It was the faith. And so you're children of Abraham, not if you're physically circumcised, but if you also have faith that God will do what he said he will do. We looked at that last week where Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as, as righteousness. That's, that's, that's what... <laughs> That's what made him the father of faith because he showed us what it was like to have faith, even not yet seeing. And Paul says, you, me, us, Gentiles, are one. And because we are one in Christ, we have access to the same father. That's verse 18. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit." The f there's three pictures that Paul gives us in just these few verses, three different word pictures for us to understand what it means for us to be seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And the first one is that we are now citizens of God's kingdom. Look at verse 19. For you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. Now we were talking in, in the book of Exodus. We've been studying Exodus on Sunday night, and we, we talked about that when a stranger came into the land of Israel, if the stranger was willing to be circumcised, then he was no longer to be treated as a stranger. He was to be treated the same as the people of Israel. So that even when the nation of Israel was created, there was an understanding that although this was done by, these are the children of Jacob, the children of the twelve sons of Jacob, that although there's a physical element to it, there is more importantly a spiritual element to that. And those who have joined with the people of Israel, again, there was a physical action, but the physical action was a representation of the faith and that they became citizens of Israel. That's what it meant to become a citizen of Israel. 
This idea of God's kingdom is a lot of places, and it's one of those, I was listening to somebody this week who was talking about God's kingdom and how central of an idea it is in the New Testament and how little we teach on it and little we even understand it. Matter of fact, I'll just throw this in there. If you, if you were to do a search for the term the kingdom of God, you would find it a lot in the New Testament. Jesus had a lot to say about the kingdom of God. If you look up the kingdom of heaven, you'll find that often. Matter of fact, just uh, this is just this has nothing to do with this morning, but just for your own edification. <laughs> um, the kingdom of, of heaven is found exclusively in the book of Matthew. A lot of scholars think that the reason that's the case is because Matthew was writing to Jews, and if you talk to Jewish people even today, they are very hesitant to say the name of God. They don't even write it. Matter of fact, if you, you can tell if you're on a website that is a Jewish website, is if every time they say God, they put G and then a blank and then D. They don't want to write out the word God, so they skip the vowel. And they do that in their writings as well. And so because Matthew was writing to Jewish people, at least this is what a lot of scholars think, instead of saying the kingdom of God, to make it um, every Jew would understand that's what he was talking about, they avoided saying the word God. And so Matthew would say kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God. Same place, best I can tell. But just so you can see how prevalent it is, I just want to highlight just a few places. In Luke chapter 8, um, soon afterward, Jesus went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve are with him. The gospel, good news is the gospel. That's what gospel means. And when it says here that Jesus is proclaiming the good news, it adds the good news is about the kingdom of God. So the gospel is actually related to this understanding of God's kingdom. Matter of fact, after Jesus rose from the dead, Acts chapter 1 verse 3, he presented himself alive to his disciples after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. What does it mean to grow as a Christian? It means to understand the kingdom of God better. Philip, in Acts chapter 8, when they believed, Philip, um, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. I could show you a lot of places, but I wanted you to see that Jesus, in his teaching before he died, spoke about the kingdom of God being related to the good news of the gospel. Okay? After Jesus rose from the dead, what he did is he came back to his disciples and he expla explained to them more about the kingdom of God. And then uh, Paul, uh, Philip and others as well, I could show you lots of other places, when they preached the good news, the good news they preached was of the kingdom of God. You remember John the Baptist? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is coming, and it's here. So that's the first thing, is there is this kingdom of God. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean that there is a kingdom of God? I think maybe one way to think about this is to understand, well, what does it mean to be a citizen of that kingdom? Because that's, in Ephesians, that's what he's talking about. Verse 19, for you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens in the kingdom of God. Jesus taught us a little bit about this in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. What comes next? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So there's this distinction between right now, the kingdom of God in heaven is one way, and Jesus was praying, taught us to pray, that how that is in heaven is how it, we should be praying that it would be here on earth. Okay, that tells us in heaven, there's no one who is disobedient to the Father. He is in complete control of his kingdom. And, and yet here there are lots of people that are not leave, living under the lordship of his kingship. <laughs> the point in all of this is that we have been made king, uh, citizens of this kingdom. 
Colossians says this, he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. There was a time that I belonged to the kingdom of darkness. I lived within the domain, that's where I belonged. And I was rescued from that and instead I was brought into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. That was the good news. John the Baptist was saying, repent because the kingdom of God has come. It is possible for you to not have to be a member of the kingdom of darkness anymore. You can now become a citizen of the kingdom of God. We actually have seen that people have lived as members of that kingdom for a long time. Hebrews chapter 11, these all, he's talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of those folks, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. God made a promise to Abraham, and he told Abraham, I will give you the land of Canaan. And when Abraham died, he was still living in a tent. He did not own one square inch of the land of Canaan. And yet he died believing that God had answered his prayer, that God had fulfilled his promise. Why? Because he recognized that there was a heavenly kingdom and that that's where he belonged and that everything that he did here on earth, he did it as an exile in someone else's kingdom. There's a lot of discussion about what does it mean for the kingdom of God to come? Is it just going to be in my heart? Are we going to have this new um, world order where Jesus is in charge and there's peace on earth and all of that? What does it look like for the kingdom of heaven to be here? And there are, in, there are in, there's some ways, there's multiple ways to answer that question. On the one hand, there is a day coming where Jesus will be in charge and his kingdom will be here on earth as it is in heaven. That will happen. And John says, even so, come Lord Jesus. We look forward to that day. But there's also a sense in which what happens is I went from not being part of the kingdom of God and living in the kingdom of the world to now I belong to the kingdom of God, but I still have to live in the kingdom of the world. That's what Abraham and Isaac and Jacob realized is that they were now exiles, foreigners. I've lost my worldly um, citizenship because I have a heavenly citizenship. And by the way, there's no dual citizenship. <laughs> it's one or the other. <laughs> David had that understanding. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, as praying, he says, We are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on earth are like a shadow. There is no abiding. He recognized that we were here for just a short period of time. Peter now, and this is where things are going to, I hope, make sense. Um, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter says, He who called you is holy. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Okay, this is the first I've said today of a command. The command is to be holy. And why do we have that command? Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I don't know if you realize this, but the people of Israel were supposed to be a nation of priests. Although there was the priestly family in Aaron and the priestly tribe in the Levites, the entire nation was supposed to be a picture to the world that anyone could look at them and say, wow, those Israelites, they're different. They're holy. They're set apart. They're special. And it's supposed to say, oh, I know why. They belong to God and God is holy. So they are pictures of God. And Peter is saying that that's true for us as believers. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. There it is again, that understanding that we are here not because we belong to the, city of, to the kingdom of the world anymore. We are exiles in this world. We are kingdoms of the light. And we are citizens of the kingdom of light. And so because of that, Peter says we're to be holy, different. My citizenship is not the same as it was before, and that should be obvious. (laughs) 
he also tells us about this whole citizenship that we are fellow citizens with the saints. And again, this is something that just needs to be mentioned. The word saint has kind of a root, sanctified, kind of comes from the same root. It's an understanding that the saints are holy people. In the Catholic Church, in order to become a saint, you have to live a holy life, and I think you have to die, although there might be some that can get sainthood before they die. It's a, it's a big deal, and there's a big difference between normal Christians and saints Christians, and the whole goal of life is try to be good enough that maybe you could get sainthood. That is not a biblical understanding at all. Matter of fact, if you will, just flip back a page. Look back at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul is an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and he is writing to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. All believers are considered saints, according to the New Testament. Now that's, in some ways, that's wonderful. (laughs) But in other ways, that's really challenging. You mean I have to live like a saint? Well, you are one. How you live is how a saint lives, because if you are in Christ, you are a saint. So what does it mean to be a citizen of the kingdom of God? Is to be with the saints, is to be holy, different, set apart, an exile in this world. And then he switches metaphors, and Paul is really famous for doing this. Paul tells us a picture, and about the time we start to get that picture in our head, he switches to a new picture. This morning's reading, he does it in, in the same verse. Look at verse 19 again. For so, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Well, that's something else entirely. Not only are we citizens of God's kingdom, we are also members of God's household. And what's happening is we're going from generic to more and more intimate. He's going to make another switch in just in, uh, in another verse here. But he's talking first off in the, in the kingdom. We are part, we are citizens of the same kingdom as God is. We are no longer strangers compared to God. Instead, we are strangers compared to this world. And in him, we are with, we're, we're citizens, we're saints with him. But we're also members of God God's household. Keep your place here in Ephesians, but if you will, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. What does it mean to be a member of God's household? Romans chapter 8, verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. Now, if you notice what Romans, what Paul is encouraging believers to do in Romans is again to live a holy life. Don't live according to the flesh. You have to be different. You're going to live according to the Spirit. And that's a very different thing. Why, you might ask, why is it that I need to live in a holy way? Is it so that I'll be made righteous before God? By no means. <laughs> The reason you need to live a holy life is because you died with Christ and you rose with Christ again and Christ is the Son of God and so because you have rose with God and you're with Christ, you are also heirs with Him. The sonship that God has in Christ Jesus has been extended to those who have been buried and raised with Him. So the reason we are part of the household of God 
is the same manner that we were able to become citizens of God's kingdom. It's all in Christ. He's the center of all of it. He took us out of the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. We were buried with him in his death and we rose with him and having rose with him, we are now brothers and sisters with him, heirs with him of the kingdom. So Paul switches metaphors, but if you notice the point is the same, the point is, is that we're special. Now, don't start patting yourself on the back and thinking high of yourself. That's what all of the, what we've been going through Ephesians has been talking about. It's not you, it's him. He's the one who made you special, but he has done that. And you are now a citizen with Christ in his kingdom, and you are now a son or daughter. You're heir to the kingdom with Christ. We're members of his household. And if you will flip back to Ephesians, he's gonna change the metaphor again. Verse 19 again, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The third picture we have here, not only are we citizens in God's kingdom and members of God's household, we are stones in God's temple. That should say temple. I wrote that wrong in my notes this morning when I was, (laughs) okay. That should say stones in God's temple. Think about this, that is a strange picture. As a kid, I got what it meant to be a citizen. I understood what it meant to be a family member. I was bothered by this picture of me being a living stone in a temple. Imagine myself in heaven being a rock and just having to sit there. And I, I, it was just a picture that I struggled with. As an adult, I'm starting to understand more. We actually in Sunday school had a lot to say about this whole building on the firm foundation, the rock. And if you take that rock from that that parable in in Matthew and in Luke that talks about um, we need to build our house on the firm foundation, which is Christ. He is the rock we're to build on, do his words. Now Paul takes that and says, and what we're going to be built is not just any old house. It's the dwelling place for God. It's his temple. The intimacy has gone even deeper than the family. I've got lots of family that don't live with me. It's pretty special to be the family that lives in the house. And what he's saying is that we're actually a part of that house. There's a lot of doctrinal things for us to just notice as we go through here. First off, the foundation is the apostles and the the prophets. Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. In my opinion, what Paul is saying here is he's describing for us the word of God. Who wrote the Old Testament? The prophets. The first five books were written by Moses, but Moses says at the end of his life, there's coming uh, one day another prophet like me. So Moses was a prophet. (laughs) Well, what about the Psalms? David, (laughs) Jesus calls David a prophet. He was prophesied about things to come. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put all your enemies under your feet. Well, what's he talking about? Jesus says what David was doing is he was prophesying. I think it is fair to say every Old Testament book is connected to a prophet. And then the New Testament would be the apostles. Some of them are obvious. The book of John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Revelation are written by John, the apostle. The book of Matthew, Matthew, the apostle. All of Paul's books are written by Paul, the apostle. And 
Maybe Hebrews, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Bottom line is I, I, I don't know exactly how all, all of it works. Um, tradition tells us that Mark was very close to Peter and that in some ways Mark's gospel is the gospel according to Peter. Mark's the one who wrote it down, but a lot of the stories and where they came from was from Peter. Um, that's what tradition has said for 15, 1600 years now. Um, at any rate, I believe what, what Paul is getting at here is that we can trust who God is from God's word. We build our life on the foundation. What is the foundation we're to build our life on? The Old and New Testaments, the prophets and the apostles. And right centered in the middle, it is not an accident that the gospels come between the Old Testament and all of Paul's writings and the rest of the New Testament. Because in, in, in a very real sense, Jesus is the center of the scriptures. He is to whom all the prophets were looking forward, and he's from whom all the apostles were sent. The prophets were looking forward to who Jesus would be, and the apostles were sent out by Jesus to declare who he was. So that what you have is, uh, the picture holds up very well. You have one cornerstone, Christ and on that cornerstone, you have one foundation, which is the prophets, the Old Testament. You have another foundation, which is the apostles, the New Testament. And it is Christ who gives meaning and understanding to all that was said. So that Jesus could accurately say in the Sermon on the Mount, build your house on a firm foundation on the rock. And this is talking about a foundation of the apostles and prophets, but recognizing that the cornerstone of that foundation is Christ himself. So built on the cornerstone of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And then if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So we're joined together. As believers in Christ Jesus, we are supposed to be united. In addition to that, we are growing together. This is a living temple. When you put stones by themselves, they don't stay very well. What has to happen? They have to be joined together. And because this is living, they're actually growing together. My understanding that of that is five years from now, we should be more grown together than we are today. That it's, it's not static. There's an activeness about us growing together. What are we growing into? Here it is again, a holy temple. We're set apart. There's something special about us. You know what the purpose of a temple is? The purpose of the temple is so that someone who wants to seek a God knows where to go to see that God. What's being said here is that we as saints, citizens in God's kingdoms, member of God's household, stones in God's temple, people around us ought to know they can come to us to find what God looks like. We are to be the temple of God. We're pointing people to him. That's half of it. The other half of what a temple is, is a temple is where God resides. If you ever have the privilege of going to India, one of the, you can drive all around and you can see temples in random spots. You'll see a middle of a field, there'll be just this random building, not very large typically, with a roof and a cage. I don't know if it's to keep the God in or keep others out, but there's a cage around the God and it typically is made out of some kind of metal. And that God lives there. It's the location of that God. That's a fake God. <laughs> but what we are told here, verse 22, in him you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. They're wrong in thinking that they should be worshiping these fake gods. They are correct in understanding that a temple is where God lives. 
and what is being told is not only are we to be blocks in the temple of God in that people look to us to see God, but also we are stones in the temple in the place where God lives. He lives with us and in us. Two places I want you to see, if you will turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. We read some of these verses in Sunday school this morning. Um, First Corinthians chapter three, verse 10. By the way, there's nothing, as a pastor, there's nothing more encouraging than the sound of pages turning in, in the Bible. So. I hope you're not bothered by the silence. I am not. <laughs> I love hearing um, y'all examining the scriptures with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. What Paul is saying, he's dealing with some divisions in the church, and some people were saying, I'm of the church of Paul, and others say, I'm the church of Apollos, and others say something else, and Paul's saying, look, we all have the same foundation. We're all part of the same temple. All I could do was lay a sure foundation, which, as we know, is Christ. And everyone else is trying to build on that foundation. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12, now if anyone builds on that foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. I want to clear up a little bit of a misconception here. Many people look at verse 17 and think that this is f fundamentally talking about why we're supposed to be good to ourselves. I need to exercise because I need to take care of God's temple. And that's not wrong. You are God's temple. But that you is not singular, it's plural. In other words, that is talking about you as the church are God's temple. You still should exercise because you are part of God's temple as part of that. But the bigger picture here is not me as an individual, it's us as a body. And what Paul is giving a strong warning here is, is that there are some, whether it was Apollos or others, and actually he's not concerned about Apollos, but there's others who are building on the foundation and they might be building in the wrong way. And he said, if you put the wrong stones in and you cause things to fall down, you're destroying the temple and God will not take that lightly. So be careful how you build. This is a warning to those of us who are leaders. There are, this is a warning to those of us who are teachers that we had better teach accurately. Because if we don't, we have the potential to possibly harm the temple of God. And God's temple is holy. Notice in all three pictures, there is a recognition of who we are in Christ. We are seated with him already. And it's driving us to live holy lives. All three pictures. Holiness comes with being attached to who God is. Flip over one more book, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul really likes these analogies. And this mixed metaphor, he does it often. <laughs> 
Here's another place we're going to watch him do the same thing. He's going to go backwards this time. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to start reading in verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion, portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with, it, of, uh, with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You see that? <laughs> We're the temple of God, and that followed immediately by, there will be my people, that's part of the nation of God, the kingdom of God, citizens of his kingdom. Therefore, go out from their midst, that's Christians should go out from the midst of unbelievers, and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty." This one passage, again, we have, you are the temple of God, you are citizens of the kingdom, and you are sons and, God, sons and daughters of God. And in all of that, what is he saying? Don't be like the world. Be holy. Now, a great deal of Christian teaching comes down to this. If we're believers, we're not supposed to look like we're not believers. There should be a distinction but there's a lot of places we can go wrong. Sometimes we go wrong because we get here and we decide that we got here by our own bootstraps. And so we become legalistic. And the only way you're going to come to my church is if you do this, 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 and this. And boy, if you mess up about this one, you are out. That's not what Scripture teaches at all. I'm not part of God's kingdom because of my greatness. I'm part of God's kingdom because of His grace exclusively his grace. I don't even know if I could have ever had enough faith in him had he not given me grace to have faith in him. I'm thankful he did, and I have fully committed to what he has given me, but I don't boast in myself at all. But the other place we err is to say, yeah, I didn't do any of it, so I'm just gonna keep on living, and God will keep on being graceful. Let me just push the mercy of God. I can sin this much and God will still forgive me. And then I can sin this much and God will still forgive me. That also is not found in scripture anywhere. Every time God makes it a point to tell you he has done something special in you, he goes on to say, therefore live holy lives. We're moving into that transition part in the book of Ephesians where we're going, now that you know you have been seated in the heavenlies, what are you going to do about it? And the answer to that question is, I'm going to live a holy life. I belong to the kingdom of God, not to the kingdom of darkness. I'm not going to live like that. I am a son of God. I'm not a son of, I'm not a slave to sin anymore. I'm not going to live that way. I'm part of the temple of God. I've been built into his dwelling. I'm not going to be unyoked with unbelievers. I'm not going to go down those paths. And so what happens is a deep desire for holiness. Oh, I want God to be pleased with my life, but not because I'm concerned he won't accept me, but because I'm thankful that he has accepted me. I recognize what he's done. Obviously, I said this at the beginning, this is a sermon to us as believers. The discussion we had in 1 Corinthians, or in, in Sunday school this morning, that 1 Corinthians passage is saying that it's possible we build incorrectly, but we still escape, we're still saved. But we were discussing a different passage. We were discussing Jesus' words where are you building your foundation? You're trying to build your foundation on the sand? Or are you going to build it on the rock? And his answer there, there will be many who say to me, Lord, Lord. They're not part of him. They did all their works in their own strength and their own power building on the sand. 
And when the storm comes, great was the fall of that house. So if you're not a believer, the first place to go is don't try to live your way into heaven. You can't do it. Ask any one of us. We have, it is not possible. <laughs> Come look at my failings. You will be convinced I could never work my way into heaven. But the offer is still there. And if you are a believer, don't take this lightly. We have been called to live as holy people, set apart, different, strangers in this world. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, give us the courage and the strength to do what you've called us to do. Specifically, Lord, move. May your spirit move in our hearts we would have your fruit abundantly working its way out in our life. Help us, Lord, to be temples that others can look to you. I pray that you would be exalted. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing a hymn of invitation. Number 300. this evening, hot dogs at um, Watson Drive at 6 o'clock. We'll have service as usual here. Um, is there a word this morning? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Remember Brenda. She was admitted to the hospital last night with congestive heart failure. Let's close this morning with singing the family of God.